Hey there, welcome to HTBB Online. We're so glad that you're tuning in right now. And I'm Abel. And I'm Jacinta. And we're your host for this service. Yeah, we hope that you had a really nice weekend. It's Malaysia Day weekend. We had a little drive somewhere out to the outskirts of KL. Uh, so we hope that you are feeling really rested this Sunday. And we have an amazing service lined up for you. Uh, we've got Jacinta preaching in a moment. We're going to start with a time of worship. And as always, let's begin with a word of prayer. So Lord, we thank you that you're here with us right now and you're ministering to us wherever we're at. And I pray, Lord, that you would come by your Holy Spirit, that you'd minister to the ones who are watching this right now, who are listening. Lord, we know that you are alive, you are real, and right now you are here. So we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. worship. Thank you. 
from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Till the stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in So Lord, we thank you that you are Lord over it all. And we ask for your help. We remember the people of Pakistan right now who are dealing with severe floods, who are grieving the loss of lives. 
Lord, we ask for your mercy for this country. We pray for help um, to come. We pray for relief agencies to coordinate themselves. Um, we pray for unity um, across the government that's trying to help uh, the people of Pakistan. We pray that you will heal this country in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for Malaysia. We thank you that we got to celebrate Malaysia Day this weekend. And, and we thank you that Jesus, you are King and you're sovereign over this land. We want to lift our leaders to you. We ask that you would continue to lead them and guide them. And would you uh, give them the wisdom that they need to lead this country well. And Lord, we thank you for HTBB. We thank you uh, for the four leaders um, who were just ordained this past weekend. Uh, Reverend Mark Knight, Reverend uh, Simon Kang, Reverend Aaron Anand, and Reverend Alvin Chi and we want to thank you for them we thank you for their lives and we thank you for the privilege it is to ordain them in Jesus mm. name we pray Amen. 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 Well, right now we're going to go into a time of giving and the QR codes will come up on the screen. They will bring you to the giving platforms. And afterwards, we're going to be watching HTBB News. And as part of HTBB News today, we've got an exciting announcement. Uh, HTBB is planting into Kuching. We're really yes. excited. So why don't you watch the video coming up ahead and let's cheer Aaron on as he leads this exciting initiative. If you're new to faith or have just finished Alpha, Discipleship Basics is for you. If Alpha was like getting to know Jesus, think of this like learning how to be a follower of Jesus. Over five weeks, we'll explore more about the Bible, discipleship practices, spiritual gifts, and the part you can play in the church. Discipleship Basics starts on 18th September until 16th October, every Sunday. Hope to see you there. If you are new here at HTBB, or maybe you've been around for a while and really like to get plugged in, we would love to meet you at the Welcome Lounge. If you have any questions to ask about the life of the church, or maybe you want to meet someone from the team, we would love to see you, to say hi to you in the cafe right next to the English Service Hall. So come join us here, mark this date down, and we would love to see you there. Hello everyone, HTBB is planning a church here in Sarawak at a city called Kuching. There are over 800,000 people living here in this city and 75% of them do not consider themselves as churchgoers. The vision of this church plan is to see the evangelization of the city, the revitalization of the church and transformation of society. The church plan has two main focus. Number one is to reach the young in the city. Beginning 7 of October, we will be running our first run of Alpha right here in this space, followed by the second round on February 2023. Do join us in prayer as we seek to fill this space with people who will begin a journey of exploring the meaning of life and faith as they encounter Jesus. And in February 2023, we want to run Alpha in schools as well. The future of the city is in the hands of this young one and we want to give all of them an opportunity to hear about Jesus and encounter Him. The second focus of this church plan is to serve the local churches in Sarawak in its effort of evangelism using the tool of Alpha. This is done in partnership with the local churches here as we seek 
to share the gospel of Jesus across the state of Sarawak. I'm reminded of these words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Our prayer that as we share the gospel and serve the local churches here, together we will see the evangelization of the city, the revitalization of church and transformation of society. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey, it's such a joy to be with you today. My name is Jacinta and I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB. A couple of weeks ago, Mal started off his sermon saying that faith is to both trust and obey. And faith isn't trust without proof, but trust without reservation. And so to have faith means to trust and obey in spite of our reservations. This reminds me of a little boy who had been going to children's church. In Sunday school, he and his friends had been going through the Old Testament and they were learning all about the Israelites. You know, scripture often refers to them as the children of Israel. So first, he learned about how the children of Israel built the temple, then about how the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, and finally, he learned about how the children of Israel entered the Promised Land. And despite the teacher's best efforts, after learning all of this, he had more questions than answers. So one Sunday afternoon, he was deep in thought, and his dad said to him, Son, are you okay? And the boy with a furrowed brow, he said to his dad, I have a question. You know, we've been learning stories from the Old Testament about how the children of Israel did so many different things. And the dad, he listened carefully and then he said, Okay, but what's your question? And the boy said, Well, the children of Israel did so many different things. Didn't the grown-ups do anything? Maybe today you're like the little boy and you feel like you have more questions than answers. Maybe you're carrying some degree of doubt Maybe it's intellectual and you're wrestling with a deep theological question. Like, is God really all-knowing or all-powerful? Or if God really loves all 7.8 billion people on the planet, how is it possible that at the same time God loves me with a personal individual love? If that's you, well, you're smart and maybe you're just better off signing up for a theological college, SPTC. Or maybe your questions are more personal. Maybe you're walking through a challenging season right now and you have doubts about God's presence in that. Maybe you have doubts for a decision you're about to take or for a family situation you're going through or you're facing some roadblocks and you doubt if God can make a way through. Or perhaps you're walking with a friend as they wrestle with their doubts. You know, the dad in this story is like a picture of God the Father. He loves it when you bring to him your questions, your reservations and your doubt. There's a person in scripture who is known for his doubts. His name is Thomas, or should I say Doubting Thomas, as he's most commonly known for. And you know, I feel really sorry for him because he's got such a bad rap. And yet, despite his reputation, there's more to his story than what we see on the surface. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And today, I want to preach from a few instances in his life that scripture talks about. And I think we can learn a lot from him as we grow as a disciple of Jesus and as we navigate through our doubt. There are three snapshots of Thomas's life that I want to highlight today. The first is an exchange he had with Jesus when they heard that their friend Lazarus had died, the story that Ton Yong preached about last Sunday. From this snapshot, we see, before he was doubting Thomas, he was daring Thomas. What do I mean? Let's read together from John 11 verses 8 to 16. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, He will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. 
Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the twin, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Amen. I wonder, what's the most daring thing you've done? You know, when I think of someone doing something really daring, I think of anything from wearing white while eating curry laksa to Tom Cruise hanging off a plane. Whatever it is, when we think of daring, we think of a scene from Top Gun basically doing something that puts someone at risk. But really, chances are when we step out of our comfort zone and choose to be courageous, that willingness comes from a place of love. Just recently, I read about this little boy who fell into a septic tank in China and immediately, without hesitation, his grandmother jumped in to save him. You see, before Thomas was doubting, he was daring. Jesus was about to go and raise Lazarus from the dead, and to get there, he needed to go through Judea. But the problem was, by this time, the religious leaders in Judea were already plotting to get rid of Jesus. In verse 8, the disciples said to him, But Rabbi, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus loved Lazarus, and it was that love that compelled him to go and to be with his sisters Mary and Martha and to raise Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus wasn't the only one who acted from a place of love. While the rest of the disciples, they seemed clueless, like they were saying, Jesus, let Lazarus sleep. Don't wake him up. He needs a rest so he can get better. Thomas, he had a different response. In verse 16, it says, Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. And as I read this, I wondered, How was Thomas so bold? What got into him that at that moment he was willing to go and risk being stoned to death with Jesus? You know, church tradition says that Thomas was called a twin because he looked like Jesus. And this put him at special risk. And so when he said, let us go that we may die with him, he was being especially bold because he could have been mistaken for Jesus. And as I study the life of Thomas, I can't help but think, Isn't this a picture of discipleship? That perhaps at the start of our journey as disciples, or when we're feeling very close to Jesus, or when we're having mountaintop experiences, it's easy to have this first love kind of faith. The kind of faith that says, Lord, I choose you over everything. The kind of faith that says, I surrender all. The kind of faith that says, my problems are great, but my God is greater. Before Thomas was doubting, he was daring because he loved Jesus. Around this time of the year, I'm reminded of this iconic advertisement featuring Tan Hong Ming and Umi Kazrina. You may have seen it before. It starts with this image of a seven-year-old boy in primary school uniform and the headline says, Tan Hong Ming in love. The interview asks him, I presume, do you have a girlfriend? And Hong Ming goes on to say her name, Umi Kazrina, and why he likes her. The interviewer then asks him, what do you wish to say to her? And Ho Ming says, really sheepishly, do you want to come on a date? A romantic dinner. Remember, he's seven years old, so I find this super cute. Anyway, the interviewer then asks him if she knows he likes her, but he says, no, I keep it a secret. I don't want the whole world to know. She doesn't like me. In the next frame, we see Umi Kazrina standing next to Hong Ming. And this time, the interviewer is speaking to her. The interviewer asks her, do you have a boyfriend? And she's silent for a while. And then she nods very shyly. And then she says his name is Tan Hong Ming. So when Hong Ming hears this, his expression is priceless. He looks at her, he takes a hand, and they walk off into the distance like a perfect picture of innocent, unadulterated first love joy. Thomas had been with Jesus for three years. And from this passage, we see how he loved Jesus with a first love kind of love. He saw everything he did, he learned from him, he followed him. He knew who he was following and he dared to go in the same direction as long as Jesus led the way. Thomas didn't just look like Jesus. He wanted to be like Jesus and he was willing to give up his life for Jesus because we become what we behold. And if you have a picture of who you want to become one day, maybe right now you're remembering a dream that in your mind has died, but in your heart is now coming alive. I I wonder if you would dare to dream again. 
part of the story of Lazarus coming back to life is Thomas daring to give up his life. How do we grow as a disciple of Jesus? We dare, just as Thomas dared. But secondly, as we grow as disciples, we encounter doubts just as Thomas did. Enter snapshot two, doubting Thomas. Let's read together from John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to him, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. Now, this passage is a really interesting one. What happens in these five verses has framed how Thomas has been perceived over hundreds of years. It's immortalized his reputation as doubting Thomas. And it almost seems as if Jesus is scolding him for believing only because he had seen. Like in verse 29, when Jesus said, Because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I can almost hear Jesus saying it in like a scolding type of voice, like the same way he might say, Oh, you of little faith. But let's go back to how this happened in the first place. You see, this incident took place just days after Jesus died. And it says right before this passage in verses 19 to 23, Jesus appeared to the disciples, except to one of them, Thomas. So we read in verse 24, it says, Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came the first time. And so when Thomas goes back to hang out with his friends, the other disciples exclaim to him excitedly, Guess what, Thomas? We have seen the Lord. I mean... If there's a recipe for making someone feel super FOMO, this is it. This is levels of FOMO, fear of missing out. Can you imagine? Jesus, their teacher and rabbi, the one whom they'd all been following and learning from for the past few years, the one who had died the most painful death and whose death they were all still grieving. This Jesus came to visit them post-resurrection, but Thomas wasn't there. If I were in Thomas' shoes, I'd feel the same way too. And so, of course, he'd say to them, as he did in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. For me, that would be like if all of my closest family and friends went to a durian buffet without me. It hurts even thinking about it. And if there's anything we can learn from how the world has responded to Thomas, is that doubt is often dismissed. And I don't know if today you're carrying any doubt and you've tried to squash it or hide it or others around you have maybe unhelpfully said, why do you doubt? Have faith, just believe. On one hand, it is that simple. We are to have childlike faith. You know, Jesus said in Luke 18, let the little children come to me for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. But on the other hand, doubt is to be expected as we grow in our journey of discipleship. Charles Spurgeon, a well-known Bible teacher, he put it like this, When a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. And actually, Scripture tells us that many heroes of the faith struggled with doubt. Abraham and Sarah, they doubted God's promise of a child. Job doubted God's goodness. Moses doubted God could use him to lead Israel out of Egypt. Gideon doubted God could use him to turn the tide against Israel's oppressors, and the nation of Israel was in a constant state of doubt. And yet, God still used them and honored them. You see, the real issue isn't whether we doubt God, because honestly, He can handle it, but rather what we do with our doubt, because doubt can lead us to follow Jesus more closely or it can deconstruct our faith. It's kind of like this um, 
this ceramic bowl. Let's say this bowl represents my faith. And as I go through life, I encounter doubts of all kinds, like, oh, there's a big hammer. Like when I did terribly in my biology exam and my teacher says, why are you even in the science stream? Or for example, when I went through a wilderness season in university and I asked, God, where are you? Or when I worked in a low-income school and wondered, where was God's justice in all of this? And just as this bowl is now in pieces, I could allow my doubt to deconstruct my faith. I could allow these pieces to be isolated and disconnected and disengaged from trying to put them back together. And today you may feel like this little old ceramic bowl. Maybe you feel like you're in pieces. Maybe today you've brought some real doubts and you feel you're on your own as you think about them. Or maybe it's easier to dismiss your doubts, to put them aside or say, ah, oh, I quite like my bowl in pieces. If that's you, dig into your doubt because doubt is not the enemy of faith, but it's the beginning of faith itself. God doesn't condemn us for asking questions. Jesus didn't scold Thomas for wanting to see the holes in his hands. But how did he respond instead? Well, we see two things. Firstly, Jesus turned up for Thomas. And secondly, he let Thomas touch him. It says in verses 26 and 27 that a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he turned to Thomas and he talked to him. Now, did Jesus need to come back a second time? He had already appeared to, this, to the disciples a week ago. But as I read the text again, I wonder if Jesus came back a second time just for Thomas. Somehow he'd heard what Thomas had said and he wanted to make sure that Thomas wasn't left out. So Jesus turned up for Thomas, but secondly, Jesus let Thomas touch him. He said in verse 27, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And I love that because not only does Jesus acknowledge his doubt by showing up just for him, he invites him to touch him. He invites him to touch his broken body just as a friend would. Jesus invites him into connection and then he reminds him of the truth. The truth that says, you can see it from these scars. The truth that says, yes, he died, but yes, he also conquered death. The truth that death will come, but in Christ, there is life after death. The truth that there may be suffering in this world, but Jesus has overcome the world. You see, if Thomas's doubt came from disconnection, his faith came from connection. If Thomas's doubt came from deconstruction, his faith came from knowing and seeing the truth the truth marked by the evidence that the one who died on the cross was the same one who now stood before them, alive. And again, it's like this ceramic bowl. At this point, it's in pieces because doubt has led to deconstruction. But let's say this golden glue represents the truth, the truth that God loves you, He's called you, He's with you, the truth that every He's using every area of your life for His goodness to mature you and to make you stronger. Jesus is that truth. And like Thomas, as we allow our doubts to draw us close to Jesus, as we read Scripture and let that truth speak over us daily, as we worship in song, singing Scripture over our circumstances, as we wrestle with our doubts in community, in connect groups, in teams and spaces where we can pray for and speak life and words of encouragement over one another. This truth is like the thread that runs through the fabric of our faith, rebuilding us and making us stronger to withstand any storm that comes our way. Just like this ball here. <laughs> now what I've just shown you is a very poor version of a beautiful Japanese practice called Kintsugi, where a Kintsugi master takes broken pottery pieces and restores them with gold. Japanese theologian Makato Fujimura, he says that Kintsugi bowls, although they were once broken, they have greater value. In the hands of the Kintsugi master, they surpass their original purpose and move into a new realm of beauty. And just as the Kintsugi master restores broken bowls, Scripture reminds us that God is our potter and we are the clay. Out of our brokenness, He brings out beauty. And as He restores us, He grows our maturity. 
Which leads me to my final point. Thomas dead, Thomas doubted, but thirdly, Thomas was devoted. Now, after Jesus shows Thomas his hands and his side, Thomas's reply is simply this, my Lord and my God. And this is significant because Thomas is Jewish and these words, my Lord, Kyrios, and my God, Theos, were reserved only for deity. You wouldn't use them on another human being. Now, throughout John's gospel, the disciples would call Jesus the Son of God or the Logos, but this declaration is said to be the climax of John's gospel, that everything points to this, that Jesus is God. Not only did Thomas declare it, he carried a posture of deep devotion to Jesus for the rest of his life. Church tradition tells us that Thomas became a missionary to India and faithfully ministered to the church in Asia. And as we look at Thomas's life and reflect on our own journeys as disciples of Jesus, I wonder if this is what devotion looks like. That we can have doubts and still choose to trust. That we may not see miracles but still choose to believe. That we can be surrendered and yet hold on to hope. This is how we move into maturity. That every day we live in the tension of faith and doubt, the seen and the unseen, suffering and hope, the now and the not yet. Like this ceramic bowl that is formed Through fire, scripture reminds us that these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. At the leadership conference a few years ago, Cardinal Tagle said, Those suffering know how to smile. And I'm reminded that C.S. Lewis said, all through history, we find that the Christians who did more for the present world were just those who thought most of the next, the apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all of them left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. This is the depth of a disciple's life. What we long for, the world cannot truly give, only a life that is offered by the one who gave his life. That as we fix our eyes on Jesus, that as we anchor our hope on a new heaven and a new earth, as we give up our lives for the promise of a future hope, it is then that we truly live. But more than what Thomas' life says about who we are as disciples, I want to land on what Thomas' life says about who Jesus is. I said earlier that there were three snapshots I want to point out, but actually there's a fourth. When Jesus said in John chapter 14 that he was going away, it was Thomas who said to him, But Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Jesus didn't just answer Thomas with his words, but through his life. You see, daring Thomas dared to go when Jesus led the way. Doubting Thomas surfaced his doubts so Jesus could remind him he is the truth. And devoted Thomas loved Jesus with duty and devotion and in him found eternal life. When we're in a desert season, Jesus is the way. When we face uncertainties, Jesus is the truth. Or when we're in a valley of the shadow of death, Jesus' promise is for eternal life. In Jesus, we can live in that tension, whether we're daring or doubting or devoted, whether we're bruised or feeling brave, because Jesus is wounded and yet alive. He's both scarred and resurrected. He's both truth and grace, fully God and fully man. And in Him, our doubts can turn to faith. And He says, come and see, come near to me, touch my hands, touch my side. Your doubts are safe with me. In this life, We will never have the answers to all our questions, but we know the one who does. So today, would you bring your doubts to Jesus? Would you allow him to restore you and strengthen you? And would you give your life for his sake, that in him you can truly live? Amen. I'd love to pray for us. Wherever you are tuning in from, you may want to invite the Holy Spirit to come And you might want to put out your hands like this, just a posture of saying, Holy Spirit, I welcome you right now. Come, Holy Spirit.
as I was preparing this, I felt that that there might be someone here who you have a difficult decision to make and you have doubts around the decision. And I think God is just wanting to remind you of who He is in that decision you're about to make, that He wants to give you peace, that He wants to guide you in that decision. There might also be someone here who you might feel like you're at the end of your rope, but I think God is wanting to remind you, as He did to Thomas, that what you feel is your end might just be your beginning. And so if that word responds to you, if you resonate with that, uh, we'd love to pray with you. You can just uh, request prayer from the team. And we're going to finish now with one final song of worship. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ my living
Well, we're so glad you could join us for service today and we hope to see you next Sunday. And right now, receive the words of the blessing. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week ahead and we'll see you again soon.